Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. Today I'm here with Paul English, who's the founder of Kayak.com. I'm sure 99.9% .9 of the audience has used your product. Paul, how do you feel? Uh, it's fun. I have to tell you, it was cool the first time I was on a plane and saw someone sitting next to me using the Kayak app on their phone. That was fun. Yeah, I think I got more. I, it, it is true now that we've become a household name. I think there's over 100 million people that use the app. But um, for some reason, the first time seeing it in the wild was the most exciting for me. Do they still give you feedback or ideas? Yeah, I, I, I love getting, you know, doing primary research. It's the best thing as a product person is talking to actual users, particularly in the wild. I mean, we all have done formal usability testing and we use different tools and bring people into the lab and do usability testing on video, but nothing is quite as good as running into a user in their environment when they're actually trying to use your product to get something done. So that was always really fun for Kayak. In the early years of Kayak, um, I, this is gonna sound really strange, but I used to kind of hang out in airports. I sometimes would buy a flight, the cheapest flight I could, say Boston to New York, just so I could get through security. And then I would sit in the terminal and I would approach people. It was just a little crazy that I did this, but I had two phones and I go up to people and I would say, um, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? I go, I'm a, I'm a programmer and I work at this company building travel software. I'd love to show you what we're working on. And I'd give them one of my phones and I'd say, here's the app, can you check it out? And I would say, do you mind if I record this? Because I, I want to show all the other programmers in the team. And I'd give them one of my phones and I'd record them on the other phone and then bring that back into engineering. And it was cool. I didn't do enough of that, but I did that in the early years when we first had our app. In, you were doing user testing before it was cool. Because now there's a whole new suite of products and processes. Yeah. And I think there's no replacement for being with the user when the user is using your product. Yeah, I actually learned that skill back at Intuit. Many years ago, I had a small e-commerce company called Boston Light. We built a product called QShop, like Quick Shop. It let people set up storefronts very easily. It's sort of a precursor to uh, Shopify in some ways. And after I sold my company, I worked for Intuit for four years. I served as VP technology for small business for QuickBooks and other products. And Intuit, I thought, had mastered the, uh, the study of how to learn from users. And they actually did, and maybe my airport stocking was based on a technique that Intuit used to do, which is back in the early days, uh, Quicken engineers would go to Staples or, or stores that would sell Quicken and they would approach people as they saw them looking at the product and they would say, hey, I'm actually a programmer, I worked on that product. Um, I'd love to interview you and watch you use it. And they actually somehow would talk people into letting them visit them in their home and use Intuit's early products. So when I first heard that story at Intuit, I was like, whoa, that like, seems like crazy boundary crossing. But it's so cool to observe people using your product in their environment, right? Because you wanna see what happens when they're using your product and they get a phone call. Uh, what happens when they're using your product and their kid comes bursting into the room? Like, do they get distracted? Do they, do they go back to your product? Do they lose their place? And I think seeing them in an actual environment where they actually need to get a task done, that's the best thing that a product leader can do. I like that point. Sometimes I think we assume that the user research is with the user looking at the screen, focusing 100% of the attention on, on the screen, while in reality, this is a story behind, during, and after that has to be taken into consideration. Yeah. Uh, sure. One thing that uh, caught my attention is you said the engineers were the ones doing this type of research. Uh, for a company as big as Intuit, why do you think they were intentionally asking engineers to get off the, get off the building and, and talk to users instead of the user research team, for example? Yeah, I think in the early days at Intuit, the, there wasn't really a user research team. And Scott Cook, who's a mentor of mine, I'm still good friends with him. He's the founder of Intuit. He really believed in primary research and he didn't think it should be limited to the product team. He really wanted the engineers also to get to interact with customers. So maybe I'll have to, because the original sort of follow me home process they did Intuit predated my time at Intuit. But um, I know it was a mix of engineers and product people both who would do that. That is really cool. And I, and I think there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn today. We, we are seeing a lot of products, small startups, medium-sized companies where they still don't have a user research team and how these responsibilities falling on their product or engineering. And regardless of the title, I think it's just a good practice for everyone in the organization to understand the user. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll tell you another funny secret about Kayak, which is a little bit unusual. We did a lot of things different than, than other software companies, but one thing is unusual about us is in the first seven or eight years, you're going to think this is blasphemous, but we didn't have any product managers. I mean, I had three designers, um, Lincoln, Cedra, and Young, and we had some really talented UI engineers. And then I would kind of do the product plan working with those guys. And I was someone who my title at Intuit was CTO. Uh, but by the time we, my title at Kayak was CTO. But by the time we um, started Kayak, I think I coded my first year. And then one of the other engineers ended up throwing out my code and replacing it. And so I, I stopped being technical and I started spending all my time on product and design. And so even though I had a CTO title, my real love for product these days is on product and design more so than how do you actually build something. Well, you, you even mentioned design. That's, that's, those are big words for someone coming from the, from the technical side. How do you get into design? I've always been obsessed with design. I'm a little bit OCD. Um, I studied typography when I was in college and I even like designed my own font back in the day. Um, I really cared a lot about typography and how things looked. And in my first job, after I got my master's degree, I replaced the user interface for a mature product. I rewrote the whole user interface in a extension language to let other people change the UI. And in doing that, it wasn't just a technical task of recoding how menus appear. It was also in how should menus appear. And so I was really concerned with speed and performance and responsiveness. Um, also earlier in my career, like very, very early in my career, my first commercial app was a video game that I created while I was in high school. And I used to be a pretty serious musician back in high school and in college. In fact, I think in, in college, my master's thesis was I developed a music synthesizer. But doing as a musician, doing design of games, you became really obsessed with timings, not just sound effects, but timings in general. And you got like very sensitive to say 50 millisecond differences between response time. And that kind of started my journey. And ever since then, really my whole career, I've worked on the user interface. That has always interested me much more than backend or database or network. And I know that you also redesign apps just for fun such as Twitter and others, how, how do, does that connect to your other real projects? Um, yeah, so design is something that I love and I, I'm not like really a true, true designer myself. I work with really great designers, but I work very intensely with them and sometimes I'll do, a lot of times I'll do drawings and take pictures of my drawings and email the designer. They'll put it in Figma, we'll go back and forth a lot, like very, very interactive. Um, I do like redesigning other products just as a experiment. It's one of the things that I do when I interview product leaders and designers both, because I also like product managers to have a UI sense if they're gonna be working on a consumer product. But I frequently will ask a product leader as I'm interviewing them to say, tell me an app on your phone that you use a lot. And they might say TikTok. And I'll say, great, I love TikTok too. Tell me what you hate about it. Like, what don't you like about TikTok? And if you were the product lead at TikTok in charge of the next version, what would you do differently? Like, what would you tear down and what would you rebuild? And I just like that assignment of trying to redesign things. Um, I had lunch with a friend today, my friend Lincoln, who's a designer. And um, we literally sat there and shred the menu like the topography of the menu at the place we went to. And um, it's just design is something to be aware and be present of your surroundings. And part of being present in your surroundings is to talk about your surroundings and engage with them and talk with other people about them. And that's really what design is for me. I come from a technical background as well. And I have to agree with you because while I don't have formal design training, I learned to develop my own point of view and appreciation for design and interest for the user research. And, and I think that is something that I expect from other product leaders that regardless of, of their main responsibilities, they need to feel comfortable having a conversation with designers and be a, a facilitator. Like obviously it's almost impossible to find someone who's 
equally good at everything, but that doesn't mean that you cannot have the curiosity to get better at everything. Yeah, that's exactly right. And even within design, I mean, product, as you know, um, involves a lot of set of skills. To be a really successful product leader, there's a lot you have to learn and become good at. And in design as well, there are very different types of designers, right? I mean, there's visual designers who do nothing but graphic design, there's interaction designers. Um, there's a lot of different types of design. And, but a lot of it I do think is based on that curiosity and reflection. I resonate with the example you gave about the restaurant because I'm also obsessed. Sometimes when I go to a restaurant and looking for things to improve, not just from the menu, but from the way maybe the person is approaching me or the, the layout of the tables and everything. I think not just product people, designers, founders in general, they just have that obsession for doing things better, or at least do we have an opinion on how things should work. And, and I think an art, uh, the art of managing those personalities uh, as, a, as a founder, as a product leader, is something that at least I didn't learn in school. So I'm wondering, how do you go about leading a team because I can imagine your experience when you were starting kayak to where it you know became was very different personally as a leader it's interesting I mean another you know we, we just mentioned curiosity another key aspect of good designers and good product people is compassion I find that I I think more than most careers in tech people that are great product leaders are great designers are very compassionate people and that they're very tuned to others. And compassion is something that I think is a skill that can be learned and, and be honed. I guest lecture at Rhode Island School of Design every semester. I have a friend who's a professor there, Oren Sherman, and he um, teaches a class actually on entrepreneurship at the design school. And the exercise that I always give the class, before 24 hours before I show up, I have the professor email the students and to say, take a picture of something that annoys you. It can't be a picture you took yesterday. It has to be a picture you take today. It can't be a picture you find on the web. That's your photo you actually take and just email it. And then during my presentation, I'll flip through some of the images and we'll talk about annoyances and irritants as inspiration for design. And good designers and good product leaders will notice irritants around them. They'll notice, as you say, you're at a restaurant, the way the person approaches you you might notice they, there might have been a better way for them to engage with you. And if you train yourself to be to notice your environment really well, you can find solutions. I think innovation is actually really easy. I think the hard thing is figuring out what problem should I work on. Uh, most startups fail for two reasons. Either there's a implosion amongst the founding team and they create a toxic culture and everyone leaves, which is sad or it's not that their code doesn't work, it's that they build tech for a problem no one cares about. So I think as an entrepreneur, your two most important skills is recruiting, but then also locking in on what's the product we're trying to solve here. And is this a problem that really a lot of people have? And is it a really big problem or a small problem? So having that connection of the customer and the compassion for their problem is step one on the journey to creating a successful product. And I can totally see a connection between this and the previous example we were discussing because for people who are obsessed about looking for opportunities and at the end of the day, you can't fix it all and you have to prioritize. And, and I think that creating that type of list of things and having, having some self-compassion as well to know that you cannot fix it all and that you also have to move on. Otherwise, you are going to be obsessed about things that you know don't really move the needle. So... That was a, a, a good piece there that I didn't think about before. I know that you have a motto you live by, which is team first, customer second, product third. That sounded kind of controversial the first time I heard it. So I would love for you to elaborate more. Yeah, um, I, I take that quite seriously. As I think about where I spend my time every day, if I look at my Google calendar today and think about the meetings that I've been in, um, most of them are around the team and kind of the dynamics of the team. It's either recruiting or tuning a team to work better together. And it's that relentless focus on kind of the psychology of the team and tuning the team. That what's, le if you're a good recruiter and you're good at managing kind of the psychology of a team, that is what leads to a team that can create magical products. If it's a team that is, you know, really strong 
contributors, but also who really loves working together. Those are the team to create magical products. So I think as an entrepreneur, my biggest responsibility, even to my investors, is to try to, try to create teams with the mojo who can create this magic. Uh, if you are able to create those teams, you then, once you're assembled, we say, let's talk about these customers, let's talk to these customers, and let's figure out how to solve their problem. Let's figure out how to like dazzle them, do something like really amazing for those customers. And so to me, it's like organize the team and lead them, solve something amazing for customers. If you do those two things really well, the profits will follow. And, and I and I think that a lot of times first time founders or even uh, product leaders tend to focus on product first because that it seems like the obvious move. It's like what you've been trained to do, build something. However, you can only go so far by building yourself, right? And, and I think that flipping it and focusing more energy into building a team that can build a product, putting your ego aside, it's, it's hard, but I don't know any other way to scale like an organization. Yeah, there is a danger of building a product too early in that if you spend a bunch of time back in the lab, not talking to customers, just working on a product, you end up falling in love with your own product and then when it's time to put it in front of customers and they give you feedback, you tend to reject their feedback subconsciously because you have fallen in love with your product and you become defensive about it. If instead you have compassion for customer problem on day one and checking in with customers about, is this solving their problem? Do you really understand their problem? What are the implications of their problem? I think that can lead to the sustainable product which will grow on its own. So Paul, how do you learn all of this because back in the day, I mean, now these days there's a lot of content and more people talking about the importance of focusing on the co customer first. But back in the day, that wasn't the, the main message. So how did you learn this by yourself? Yeah, I grew up in a family of nine. So I had seven, there were seven kids and, and my parents, so a family of nine. And I grew up in a small house. And as a kid in a small house with nine people, you're tuned to the dynamics of what's happening around you. So when I first started working on software products, I was just very tuned to people's feelings and emotions. And I wanted to see their emotions when they saw my product. So if I got people really excited about the video game that I created when I was in high school, I knew this was something great. If people said this is fun and then they stopped playing, um, I knew that I hadn't built something innovative enough yet. So I think it's that just being tuned to people's emotions and in knowing that, you know, it, those of us who work in the tech industry, privileged enough to work in the tech industry, we're building technology, but our technology really only scales if people get positive emotions from using it. And I've been spending a lot of time to get in touch with my emotions and I, I've done coaching and, and different things and I still, it's a work in progress for me. And so I find fascinating when you mention things such as compassion or being tuned with people's emotions. Uh, is there anything in particular that you did to explore some of those concepts deeper? Did you get any external help? Was there any course, any mentor, anyone that at least helped you? Yeah, it's funny. Um, two of my siblings are therapists and Buddhists, and we talk a lot about emotion and compassion. So I learned from them a lot. I took a, a, a seminar, a class on compassion at the Cambridge Insight Meditation Center, just outside of Boston. And I think, um, again, compassion is a skill that can be honed. And I think becoming a more compassionate leader is good, not just for your team, but it's good for your products and it's good for your customers. So I really do think, you know, we talk about the restaurant, when that waiter approaches you, you can think about how they could have approached you in a better way. Like what should have they said that would have been more efficient or more friendly, whatever. But you also should, should think about how's their day going and what would it be like to be that waiter in a really crowded restaurant? So I think just being, trying to be tuned in to the emotions of people around you ultimately leads to building products that, that get good emotion response. I know that sounds crazy, but it is how I think about design. It, it does sound crazy, I agree, but I also agree with what you said, because I think the first time I got exposed to these uh, tools 
And basically for me, it was giving people the benefit of the doubt. Or as you said, like maybe that person had a hard day. Maybe that person, you know, like instead of assuming, oh, that person doesn't know and has a, like really trying to give people a chance um, and lead by example. I think those are concepts that are really hard to master. I, I can't claim to, has, to, to master my enemies, but I'm loving this conversation because instead of focusing so much on the hard or technical skills, we're talking about really soft skills and especially feelings which is something we can we we all have we we could we can push them down but they exist and and i think that the sooner we get in touch with those emotions um the better for 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 us individually but i think especially as leaders it's important to create this type of culture of vulnerability i would say I, I, that's something that at least works with me and and the one way and make it work is by showing vulnerability first because it's very easy to say well we all have to be vulnerable we all have to be this but I, I you have to show exactly the, the example that you want to see yeah i love that i mean i often say that when i compare entrepreneurs and founders that people will follow confidence but they'll be loyal to vulnerability and if you get real with your team and you're just honest like really honest including being vulnerable people tend to get loyal to that. People respect transparency and they respect honesty. It's so hard and also so counterintuitive in certain cultures, at least uh, you know, here in Silicon Valley or in tech in general. I grew up with the idea of, first of all, you have to, you cannot be a product manager. You have to be a visionary. You don't have to be born with these amazing ideas. And it's all about that. And then being hard on yourself, being hard on others or not disclosing enough, being this constant superhero. And I think that it took me a long time to, to try to remove some of those mental models. And I can only imagine how hard it is for other people if they haven't been exposed to some of the, the tools that, at least in my case, I've been grateful enough to at least see at some point in my life. Yeah. You mentioned Buddhism, and, and I think that's another thing. Like I, I, I grew up in, a, in, in Europe in a very Catholic culture or religion. I, I didn't give the, I, I, it wasn't, I didn't get the chance to choose anything i was kind of given to me based on where i was born and one of the incredible things when i moved to the us was to know that there are options there's access to opportunity you have to work for it but at least you know what's in the menu yeah i mean buddhism has been meaningful for me um there's so much i've learned from it that i think does relate to my skills as a leader i like the buddhist lessons on suffering that suffering is universal and what can we do to reduce suffering and how can you be present with um, with negative change around you and have it not sort of keep you down? And how can you help other people that have negative things around them? So there's a, there's a lot of valuable lessons there. So what is next for Paul English? Well, um, I've created half a dozen company so far. Um, the two companies I'm working on right now is Lola.com, which is business travel and expense management. And we're going to have some news in October. Um, so check back. And then I also work on a podcast player called Moonbeam. The website is moonbeam.fm. And the problem we're looking at at Moonbeam is how do people find your show? As a, as a podcast host, uh, what can we do using machine learning to show get people to better content quickly without making them read through and navigate through lots of menus and lots of content? So it's like instant gratification fed by machine learning. And how do you split your time between these companies and all the things that you have to do? I'm pretty disciplined about my time management. Um, as I mentioned, I use Google Calendar and all my appointments are one of four colors. So purple is Lola, which is like my day job and where I spend most of my time Monday, Friday, nine to five. Um, yellow is nonprofit. I'm on seven nonprofit boards and there's three nonprofits that I started that I run and spend a lot of time on that. Uh, green is self-improvement, which is anything from going to meditation class, to going to the gym, to going to the doctor's appointment. And then blue is everything else, sort of friends and family. And every Monday, Friday, 
my assistant Eliza and I look at my calendar two weeks out and I make sure there's the right balance between those four things. And if I have balance, life feels really good and stress-free. And it sounds crazy to think of like how many boards I'm on and companies I'm running and nonprofits I'm running and I also teach, but somehow I have a life with very little stress. And I think the reason I don't have stress in my life is I'm disciplined about my time management. And I, I make sure that I'm doing enjoyable things every day. Even like within Lola, I make sure that I'm meeting with designers every day because I love design. That is uh, amazing, Paul. And, and I like the, the, the color coding of your calendar. I ask this question to a lot of other founders and product leaders. And, and I agree with you. Like I also have my different colors and whatever is not on my calendar doesn't exist. Yes, it seems like a lot, but I always say that busy people always find time for things that are important to them. Yeah, I mean, there's a corollary to that, which is if you want to get something done quickly, hand it to the busiest person you know, because the busiest person you know is the person who can crank their work. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's been awesome to, to learn from you. Thank you so much for your time. Great. It's great to meet you. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed it.